Hey guys, I'm gonna keep this short, but if you aren't already aware, I started a GoFundMe. Why am I doing this now? What could I possibly need money for? I'd like to be able to pay my actors. I'd also like an easier time editing, but in order to do that, I need your help. The link will be down in the description below. I'll be running this ad for a little while. And if you can't donate, I would greatly appreciate just you sharing it with people. Get the word out there. Let's make this the best horror podcast on the internet. Thanks. You can really talk to the dead? Yes, I am able to communicate with the other side. It's... it's my wife. Can you talk to my wife? I can certainly try. Yes, I am establishing a connection. It seems your wife has an important message for you. What, what is it? She, she wants you to know that Anchor.fm is the easiest way to make a podcast. What? Anchor has all the tools that you need to get started. You can record directly in the app, monetize your podcast through ads. It even distributes to multiple listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Are, are, you, are you being serious right now? It's everything you need in one place, and best of all, Anchor is completely free. This, this has to be a joke, right? Uh, I'm losing the connection. She has one last thing to say. Download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Ugh. Yeah, I'm gonna want my money back. That's probably fair. podcast contains subject matter that may be disturbing to some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Four imprints, one. One It's time to open the door in your mind. Sit back and listen to true horror. But be careful what you allow in. Because it's time to go through, through the, fog. the fog. Before I get into the episode, let me just say, I really appreciate everyone who listened so far. It was a lot of work putting this show together, but I'm really happy with what we ended up creating. And thank you to everyone who helped me in any way, shape, or form, whether it just be voices or advice or just someone to talk to about frustrations. You all really helped me through this process. After this episode, we're going to be taking a hiatus for a while. Season two has a lot of changes, and I honestly don't know when it's going to launch. But when it does, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with the end result. So, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thanks for reviewing, rating. Podcasts like these would not happen without listeners like you. So, for the final time. This week's story is the Russian sleep experiment. Hosted by an unknown author to creepypasta.fandom.com. Russian researchers in the late 1940s kept five people awake for 15 days using experimental gas-based stimulant. They were kept in a sealed environment to carefully monitor the oxygen intake so the gas didn't kill them, since it was toxic in high concentrations. This was before closed-circuit cameras, so they only had microphones and five-inch thick glass porthole-sized windows into the chamber to monitor them. The chamber was coated with books, Costs to sleep on, but no bedding. 
running water, and a toilet, and enough dried food to last all five for over a month. The test subjects were all political prisoners deemed enemies of the state during World War II. Everything was fine for the first five days. The subjects hardly complained, having been promised, falsely, that they would be freed if they submitted to the test and did not sleep for 30 days. Their conversations and activities were monitored, and it was noted that they continued to talk about increasingly traumatic incidents in their past, and the general tone of their conversations took a darker aspect after the four-day mark. After five days, they started to complain about the circumstances and events that led them to where they were and started to demonstrate severe paranoia. They stopped talking to each other and began alternately whispering into the microphone and one-way mirrored portholes. Oddly, they all seemed to think they could win the trust of the experimenters by turning over their comrades, the other subjects in captivity with them. At first, the researchers suspected that this was an effect of the gas itself. After nine days, the first of them started screaming. He ran the length of the chamber repeatedly, yelling at the top of his lungs for three hours straight. He continued attempting to scream, but was only able to produce occasional squeaks. The researchers postulated that he had physically torn his vocal cords. The most surprising thing about this behavior is how the other captives reacted to it. Or rather didn't react to it. They continued whispering to the microphone until the second of the captives started to scream. The two non-screaming captives took the books apart, smeared page after page with their own feces and pasted them calmly over the glass portholes. The screaming promptly stopped. So did the whispering to the microphones. After three more days passed, the researchers checked the microphones hourly to make sure that they were working, since they thought it was impossible that no sound could be coming from five people inside. The oxygen consumption in the chamber indicated that all five must still be alive. In fact, it was the amount of oxygen five people would consume at a very heavy level of strenuous exercise. On the morning of the 14th day, the researchers did something that they said they would not do to get a reaction from the captives. They used the intercom inside the chambers. Hoping to provoke any response from the captives, they were afraid were either dead or vegetables. They announced, We are opening the chamber to test the microphones. Step away from the door and lie flat on the floor or you will be shot. Compliance will earn one of you your immediate freedom. To their surprise, they heard a single phrase in a calm voice respond. <laughs> Debate broke out among the researchers and the military forces funding the research. Unable to provoke any more responses using the intercom, it was finally decided to open the chamber at midnight on the 15th day. The chamber was flushed with the stimulant gas and filled with fresh air. Immediately, voices from the microphone began to object. Three different voices began begging, as if pleading for the life of loved ones to turn the gas back on. The chamber was opened and soldiers sent in to retrieve the test subjects. They began to scream louder than ever, and so did the soldiers when they saw what was inside. Four of the five subjects were still alive, although no one could rightly call the state that any of them were in life. The food rations past day five had not been so much as touched. There were chunks of meat from the dead test subjects' thighs and chest stuffed into the drain in the center of the chamber, blocking the drain and allowing four inches of water to accumulate on the floor. Precisely how much of the water on the floor was actually blood was never determined. All four surviving test subjects also had large portions of muscle and skin torn away from their bodies. The destruction of flesh and exposed bone on their fingertips indicated that the wounds were inflicted by hand. Not with teeth, as the researchers initially thought. Closer examination of the position and angles of the wounds indicated that most, if not all of them, were self-inflicted. The abdominal organs below the ribcage of all four subjects had been removed, while the heart, lungs, and diaphragm remained in place. The skin and most of the muscles attached to the ribs had been ripped off, exposing the lungs through the ribcage. All the blood vessels and organs remained intact. They had just been taken out and laid on the floor, fanning out around the eviscerated but still living bodies of the subjects. The digestive tract of all four could seem to be working, digesting food. It quickly became apparent that what they were digesting was their own flesh that they had ripped off and eaten over the course of days. Most of the soldiers were Russian special operatives at the facility. But still, many refused to return to the chamber and remove the test subjects. They continued to scream to be left in the chamber and alternatively begged and demanded that the gas be turned back on lest they fall asleep. To everyone's surprise, the test subjects put up a fierce fight in the process of being removed from the chamber. 
One of the rest of soldiers died from having his throat ripped out. Another was gravely injured, having his testicles ripped off and an artery in his legs severed by one of the subject's teeth. Another five of the soldiers lost their lives, if you count the ones that committed suicide in the weeks following the incident. In the struggle, one of the four living subjects had his spleen ruptured and he bled out almost immediately. Medical researchers attempted to sedate him, but this proved impossible. He was injected with more than 10 times the human dose of morphine derivative and still fought like a cornered animal, breaking the ribs and arm of one doctor. His heart was seen to beat for a full two minutes after he bled out, to the point there was more air in his vascular system than blood. Even after it stopped, he continued to scream and flail for another three minutes, struggling to attack anyone in reach, and just repeating the words, more, over and over, weaker and weaker, until he finally fell silent. The surviving three test subjects were heavily restrained and moved to a medical facility. The two with intact vocal cords continuously begged for the gas, demanding to be kept awake. The most injured of the three was taken to the only surgical operating room that the facility had. In the process of bringing the subject to have his organs placed back into his body, he found that he was effectively immune to the sedatives that they had given him to prepare for the surgery. He fought furiously against his restraints when the anesthetic gas was brought out to put him under. He managed to tear most of the way through a four inch wide leather strap on one wrist, even though the weight of a 200 pound soldier was holding that wrist as well. It took only a little more anesthetic than normal to put him under, and the instant his eyelids fluttered and closed, his heart stopped. In the autopsy, the test subject that died on the operating table, it was found that his blood had triple the normal levels of oxygen. His muscles that were still attached to his skeleton were badly torn when he had broken nine bones in his struggle to not be subdued. Most of them were from the force his own muscles had exerted on them. The second survivor had been the first of the group of five to start screaming. His vocal cords destroyed when he was unable to beg or object to surgery, and he only reacted by shaking his head violently in disapproval when the anesthetic gas was brought near him. He shook his head yes when someone suggested, reluctantly, they tried the surgery without anesthetic, and did not react to the entire six-hour procedure of replacing his abdominal organs and attempting to cover them with what remained of his skin. The surgeon presiding stated repeatedly that it shouldn't be medically possible for the patient to still be alive. One terrified nurse assisting a surgery stated that she had seen the patient's mouth curl into a smile several times whenever his eye met hers. When the surgery ended, the subject looked at the surgeon and began to wheeze loudly, attempting to talk while struggling. Assuming this must be something of drastic importance, the surgeon had a pen and pad fetched so the patient could write his message. It was simple. Keep cutting. The other two test subjects were given the same surgery, both without anesthetic as well, although they had to be injected with a paralytic for the duration of the operation. The surgeon found it impossible to perform the operation while the patients laughed continuously. Once paralyzed, the subjects could only follow the ascending researchers with their eyes. The paralytic cleared their system in an abnormally short period of time, and they were soon trying to escape their bonds. The moment they could speak, they were again asking for the stimulant gas. The researchers tried asking why they'd injured themselves, why they ripped out their own guts, and why they wanted to be given the gas again. Only one response was given. I must remain awake. awake. All three subjects' restraints were reinforced and they were placed back in the chamber, awaiting determination as to what should be done with them. The researchers facing the wrath of the military benefactors for having failed the stated goals of their project considered euthanizing the surviving subjects. The commanding officer, ex-KGB, instead saw potential and wanted to see what would happen if they were put back on the gas. The researchers strongly objected, but were overruled. In preparation for being sealed in the chamber again, the subjects were connected to an EEG monitor and had the restraints padded for long-term confinement. To everyone's surprise, all three stopped struggling the moment it was let slip that they were going back on the gas. It was obvious that at this point, all three were putting up a great struggle to stay awake. One of the subjects that could speak was humming loudly and continuously. The mute subject was straining his legs against the leather bonds with all of his might. First left, then right, left again for something to focus on. The remaining subject was holding his head off his pillow and blinking rapidly. 
Having been the first to be wired for EG, most of the researchers were monitoring his brainwaves in surprise. They were normal most of the times, but sometimes flatlined inexplicably. It looked as if he was repeatedly suffering brain death before returning to normal. As they focused on paper scrolling out of the brainwave monitor, only one nurse saw his eyes slip shut at the same moment his head hit the pillow. His brainwaves immediately changed to that of deep sleep, then flatlined for the last time his heart simultaneously stopped. The only remaining subject that could speak started screaming to be sealed in now. His brainwave showed the same flat lines as the one who died from falling asleep. The commander gave the order to seal the chamber with both subjects inside, as well as all three researchers. One of the three immediately drew his gun and shot the commander point blank between the eyes, and then turned the gun on the mute subject and blew his brains out as well. He pointed his gun at the remaining subjects, still restrained to the bed as the remaining members of the medical and research team fled the room. I won't be locked in here with these things! Not with you! He screamed at the man strapped to the table. What are you? He demanded. I must know! The subject smiled. Have you forgotten so easily? Have you forgotten? The subject asked. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all. Begging to be set free. Free. Every moment in your deepest animal mind. animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. Every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go into the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. Haven. The researcher paused, then aimed at the subject's heart and fired. The EEG flatlined as the subject weakly choked out. So, so nearly. nearly. Free. Free. Before I sign off, I want to say one more time, thank you so much for listening. It really does mean the whole world to me. And I hope that you'll join us when we are back with season two. If waiting isn't your thing, you can also head over to my YouTube channel, Reachable, through my website, www.throughthefogcast.com Thanks again and keep your eyes on the fog. Through the Fog is recorded and edited by Haptic. Produced by Flyover State Park and Kevin Caravan. All stories are recorded with the original author's permission or released under a Creative Commons share-like license. For more episodes, visit throughthefogcast.com or follow fog underscore cast on Twitter. Links to both are in the show notes. You can support the show by visiting buymeacoffee.com slash throughthefog or simply by rating and reviewing on your podcatcher of choice. It's the simplest way to support independent shows like these. Whatever you decide to do, though, thank you for listening, and talk to you next week.